Well, good morning. Hey, glad you guys are here. Man, what a blessing uh, this morning just to be able to roll out of bed and to uh, come to a place where other people are like-minded and we want to worship God and lift Him up. How many people have got a past? Right? Yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah, not everybody, everybody in the room's got one, right? Whether you like it or not, right? Uh, they warned me when I was in grade school that it was going to go on my permanent record. <laughs> Apparently it did, right? Can you think back to a time in your life when you said something you immediately regretted? Yeah. Why don't they put a delete button, right, or a backspace on our mouths, right? Like, why can't I get that back? If only, have you ever said, if only I hadn't ever said that, right? Parents, here's, here's the reality. Our words shape our children's lives. I know that's nothing new to you, but maybe it's just a reminder this morning. I talked back to my mom once, didn't end well, right? I've said plenty of words in emails and text messages that I wish I could get back. I wish I could delete them. I've said things in anger that I wish I had never spoken. I haven't always been a Christian So I know some curse words, right? We might ask ourselves, how did those words get in me, right? How how did those words come out? Where did they come from? Have you ever said something and said, did that just happen? Did I just say that? And we often joke and we say, well, inside words sometimes get out, right? Right? The reality is, those words are in us, in our heart. And sometimes they come out. They're lurking just beneath the surface, or maybe you have so much self-control that you can push that down to to a place where you will never use that except when you smash your finger with a hammer. Right? Like, we're, I haven't said that in a long time, right? But it's in there. They're lurking deep inside of us. And as we continue our sermon series in the book of James, James is going to take the better half of the third chapter, and he's going to help us unpack the truth about the words we speak and the truth about what God speaks to us in our lives. The words we speak, they matter. Our words matter. Let me read. I'm going to read a bunch of scripture, all right? So don't get lost and take off on me or leave the room with your head. Stay in the the room, stay in the word, stay in the scriptures with us as we read, okay? So here we go. James chapter 3 verses 1 through 12 says this. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. I'm looking forward to that. We'll all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect. I'd like to meet that person. Able to keep their whole body in check when they put bits into their mouths of horses to make them obey us. We can turn the whole animal. Verse 4, or take ships as an example, James says. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder whenever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a very small part of the body, but it makes great boast. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Verse 6, The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, 
sets the whole course of one's life on fire and it and it's it and is itself set on fire by hell. We'll come back to that in a little bit. All kinds of animals and birds and reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deathly poison. Verse 9, when the tongue, with the tongue we praise our, our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who are made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh, can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? No. My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs. Neither can a salt spring produce salt water. And there's a lot of scripture there. There's a lot of piece of there about our tongue, about our words we choose, about, about the how we communicate, communicate with one another. And James is giving some great examples there, and we'll come back to those. The Bible has a lot to say about our words. They places a high value on taming the tongue. Here are some other scriptures. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. Do everything without grumbling and complaining or arguing. Let me read that again, just in case we didn't hear it. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. Some verses say complaining. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 through 4. But among you, there must be not even a hint of sexual immorality or in of kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse jesting which is out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Replace those things with thanksgiving. Psalm 141 says in verse 3, Set a guard over my mouth. Lord, keep watch over the door of my lips. In other words, don't let that bad stuff slip out. Put a guard in front of it to keep my mouth from saying things that hurt. Proverbs 12, 18. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Proverbs 17, 9. Whoever would foster love covers over an offense, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. A lot of wisdom in that. Proverbs 26, 20. <laughs> Makes so much sense. Without wood, a fire goes out. Without a gossip, the quarrel dies down. Right? Have you ever had one of those conversations and, and you, you with somebody you know, or maybe you're talking about somebody else who has hurt you, you know, and it's been a long time, and you're just rekindling that fire again? You're just throwing some more sticks so it flames back up? Just let it die. So many verses in Scripture talk about the words we choose to use with one another. But I want to look at this one from James chapter 1, verse 26. He says, Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. We might be the best at studying our Bible. We, we might be the person that, that, that sits in every Bible study, every class, everything we could ever do and learn, and we would know all sorts of things about the Bible. That we would never miss a Sunday. That, that, that we, we would do everything we can. That, that, that we would be in God's word, but we are not cautious about the words that come out of our mouths, James is saying that person's knowledge 
is, and their religion is worthless. You ever met somebody like that? Yeah. That, that sometimes they even weaponize the scriptures, right? To cause hurt, to cause pain, to inflict brokenness. God doesn't want us to be that type of people. He wants us to be the sort of people who have consistency with our word. Because the words that come out of our mouths are a reflection of what is in our heart and what is going on inside of us. Is that true? It's true the opposite way, right? If I'm feeling anxious, if I'm depressed, if I'm mad, if, if, if I'm angry, good words do not come out. Am I telling the truth? So wouldn't it make sense that the other side of that coin would also make sense? If my life is filled with joy, if I, if I am praising God, if I am thankful, if, if my life is, is uh, in a place where I am submissive and, and following Christ, it would make sense that Christ-like things would come out, right? Yeah. Now, I've lived long enough to know that that's true. And when my heart's not settled, my mouth isn't either. Right? Listen, it's not about having self-control or being disciplined. That's not what this is about. That, those are components of it. It's about having our hearts restored by a God who loves us, being renewed and made new. The goodness of God all flows out of us. That's what's happening. It's not that I can control my mouth. It's not that I have, uh, I have this file of curse words or bad things and I keep it over here. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about getting rid of that and filling up our hearts with God's goodness. Listen to what Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, verse 45. He says, a good man brings good things out of the good, out of the good stored up in his heart. Makes sense, right? Good man brings good things out of the goodness stored up in his heart. And we know, we say things like, God is good, right? All the time, right? And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. Makes sense, right? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Wow. So think back to a moment, maybe this morning. Maybe, maybe you're in a better place. Maybe it was yesterday, right? Think back to a time where you said something, and, and I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. This is not what we're, not what we're talking about. We're talking about let's examine our hearts in that moment. Where was I at? Then I spoke those words. Does it, does it give evidence to truth of what Jesus is saying? Parents, if we run behind, does our voice and our actions become hurried and worried and anxious and we say things, right, with a bite to them? People say that the eyes are a window to the soul. But the Bible tells us the words, the words that come out of our mouth, they come from our heart. When I was in the Air Force, I was uh, part of an uh, ultra-secret, uh, top-secret black program. You guys know it as the B-2. In the early days, we never spoke about it. We never talked about it because it was so top-secret. Nobody had seen it yet. Nobody had, we hadn't even flown it yet. It was many times that parts were on the drawing board. They weren't even made yet. So when we had to go have dental work done and we were going to be under anesthesia, they would send somebody, what they call uh, OSI, 
the Office of Special Investigations. This is, a, this is a, basically a detective or a police officer. They would go with me to the dentist. And so they would read to the dentist and the assistants and all those people. They'd say, you have to sign this paperwork. Sergeant Buttram's going to be under anesthesia. And if he says anything, you cannot repeat it. Our words matter. Even the government knows that, right? And how many of us under the influence of something have said some really dumb stuff, right? I love the videos of parents driving their kids home after a wisdom teeth are pulled out, right? The funny stuff that they say, right? That's exactly what we were talking about here. That, that's why the OSI would go with us and say, all right, you need to... <laughs> <laughs> Whatever he says, you can't repeat, right? I always worried I would say something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The content of our speech reveals the condition of our heart. The what we say, the how we say it, speaks to where our heart is, where it's been. I want to push pause just for a moment because there's a real risk where uh, I have stepped on your toes, right? And I'm okay with that. But how are we doing so far? Can we, can we keep pressing? Okay. Am I, am I speaking the truth? Are you getting something out of this? Okay. I don't mind stepping on your toes, I just, I want to make sure you're with me. I haven't lost you. Because some of the words, some of the words we might use that sometimes slip out, right? Inside words getting out, uh, reveals the content of our heart. And we can feel pretty bad about that because we feel like I am not where I'm supposed to be. That's a good thing. Not that the words came out, but, but it's a good thing to recognize and to see, I am not where I need to be in my faith. I need to mature, I need to grow, I need, to, I need help in exactly what James is talking about. James is going to give three illustrations to help us to appreciate how powerful our speech is and how it reveals where our heart is. Man, I think back to this, how many times I could have avoided some real pain if I would have heeded or listened to the words that are being taught here. And, and in ra reality, right, sometimes it's a gut check just to kind of go, okay, before I speak, I need to ask the question, where am I at? Where am I at emotionally? Am I mad? Then not good things are going to come out, right? Right? If I'm angry, then I'm going to say some stuff that's going to be over the top, and I'm going to regret. If I'm sad, I'm going to be downcard. I'm going to be, uh, I'm not going to be upbeat. I'm a cynic, right? Checking ourselves before we talk is really important. I think James said something about that before, right? If I remember right, he says in first chapter... Verse 19, he said, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Who knew? I mean, I think, uh, I think uh, as I watched last week, Chris Brandt said that, he, that, that James was writing the content or the rules for Facebook, right? That we should follow those rules. For multimedia, for, for any kind of social media. James begins by talking about an image of a horse, right? a 2,000 pound animal. Maybe, I don't know, maybe bigger. 2,000 pounds, is that like medium or 4,000? Out 1,000, okay. So 2,000 would be a big horse, really fat, eating too much, right? <laughs> it's always good that you fact check your stuff in the middle of a message, right? Yeah, that's really important, right? 
If only everybody did that, right? It's amazing to me that they can put this small bit, right, in the mouth of a horse, a thousand pound plus animal, and can turn its head by just a nudge, right? Just feeling the weight of the, of, of the what is that called? The, the, the steering wheel, what's that called? <laughs> the reins, okay? <laughs> I'm looking for handlebars, right? Yeah. <laughs> Again, I should have fact-checked before. Should have had all my stuff here. James doesn't talk about that, so he... <laughs> So I'm kind of running blind here. The reins. So just feeling the weight of the reins changes the horse's direction. That's an amazing illustration to me. The same thing can happen with our tongue, right? <laughs> just a little tweak can change the course of the outcome or the direction we're going to go. right? If I start off angry... You could better believe that the rest of the conversation is not going to go well either. But I start off with joy and happiness, and I start off with love. It's going to look way different, right? Next, he talks about a ship in verses 3 through 4. He says, or ver- chapter 3, verse 4, he says, Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder. Wherever the pilot or the captain wants to go. Anybody remember the container ship a couple last year? It got stuck in the Suez Canal? Yeah. You know what caused that? The pilot was, the captain was a little off track. He, he, didn't, he wasn't taking into effect of the storms and the winds that were blowing, and he didn't steer and align the ship. Because somebody else had just passed through their equal size just minutes before he did. But he wasn't paying attention. And the rudder didn't work. He ran ashore. This, this four football field ship clogged up the entire western hemisphere. Right? I, I think somebody even said that it caused COVID. Right? It, it was that big of a catastrophic event, right? That it cost $30 billion worth of, worth of lost funds, lost money, because it, it stopped the flow of goods. James says the same thing can happen with, with our lives. Our tongues can cause a huge problem when they get, they steer us in the wrong direction. Finally, he talks about a spark that can cause devastating forest fires. In, in 2018, California had one of the worst forest fires in history. 85 people died. It says $30 billion worth of, worth of land and, and buildings were damaged. Two entire cities were completely lost. They, they no longer exist. Everything was consumed by fire. And do you know what caused that fire? There's a spark. Somebody hit a power line with their car. Pole fell over. Spark. Fire. That much damage. A spark. James says that can happen with our tongues. We can set fire so much and do so much damage with the words that we choose and the words that come out of us. Verse 6, he says, The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Let me, let me dig into that a little more. Because if we left that alone without any explanation, you, you might go home and want to cut your tongue out. I don't want, I don't want you to do that, all right? 
And it's interesting to me that James would use this axiom for the words we speak, that the idea of those words can ignite a fire, and they are then themselves ignited by evil. We have an enemy, and his name is Satan. Right? You, you understand there's a war going on, right? You also understand we win. Okay. He does his very best work when he destroys a Christian's character. Ruins people's lives. He, he wants to decay relationships. He wants to destroy marriages and churches. Satan is a liar and he's a murderer. And one of the ways that he carries out some of his most diabolical and destructive work is by our words. Not by his words. Not by the words that he speaks, but by the words that we speak. And I wonder how many people this morning are struggling. That's why I asked the question, do you have a past? How many of us are struggling with the past? The pain that caused us so much because of words that were spoken either to us or about us. That they have shaped our lives. That they have been assigned to you. That words that have held you back, words that have devastated your heart, words that have damaged your soul, your ego, the how you view yourself, the how you love yourself. It's if as Satan himself lit the fuse, pulled the pin, and then gave it to somebody else to deliver the message. That's what James is saying. Maybe you've had a reputation slandered. Maybe you've been accused of something. Relationships have been ruined. Marriages broken because of words that are spoken. Words are, those words are set on fire in hell and tossed into your life. Don't be deceived or ignorant. Just as a pirate wants to take over a ship, Satan would love to hijack your mouth, your tongue, your heart, so that you can deliver more poison. Am I telling the truth? So James gives us this verse, verses 10 through 12, he says, Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? No. My brothers and sisters, can a fig, from a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? The answer is no. Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. God wants our words to be consistent with the words that we choose this morning. The words of praise that we lifted up should be consistent with the words that we will use the rest of the week. Before I came to know Jesus and follow him, my language was terrible. I am ashamed of it even today. One day I was talking with a friend of mine, and I remember I was not a Christian, and, and so he is a Christian, and I'm, I'm explaining something happening, you know, and I'm using all these explicit words, right? And, and, and I'm, I'm throwing new ones out there, right? And I'm making them up as I go, right? And, and, and we get done, I'll never forget what he said. He said, are you going to kiss your mom with that mouth? That just, that, that just like drove an arrow into my heart. Now, I wasn't a Christian at the time, but I felt like, wow, that, yeah, I, I am, but that's not, <laughs> I didn't think of it that way. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and our Father, and then we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. It's like, wow, I don't like the way you look. And we begin to talk about them, right? Well, God made that person. It's not okay. 
<laughs> Think of it this way. Maybe, maybe you do something like this. You compliment somebody to their face, right? Oh, you did a great job today, right? And then in another room, when they're not present, you will talk about how terrible they are, right? Do you see how that is not in alignment with what God is calling us to do? That it makes, James would say, it makes your worship worthless. That what you've done so far this morning, God never heard it. Whoa. That hurts. Think of the prayers that you have lifted up. God never heard them. Paul would write Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. We, we say things like this. Love is doing what is spiritually best for the other person. I'm going to add something to this morning. Love is doing and saying what is spiritually best for the other person. Choose to celebrate the good. Instead of picking apart the two or three faults that you find in somebody, choose to say the things that are good. Celebrate their lives, all the good that you see in them, and just shut up about the rest of it. Is that, is that did I say that in a plain way? Did you get that? I can say it in the Greek if you want, but... I don't think it'll have the same effect. Satan would love for us to focus on the brokenness among us and point it out. We already know we're broken, but our Heavenly Father wants us to use words that will restore and build each other up. Our challenge, our challenge, so I asked the worship team to come on up this morning, our challenge is to decide how we're going to allow our tongues to be used. That we can choose. There is no excuse and say, well, the devil made me do it. That doesn't work. How our tongues are going to be used and by who is going to get to use them. We can be commandeered by evil. By the enemy to deliver more brokenness? <laughs> like we need more of that in our lives, right? Or we could sur surrender control to God to rebuild our faith, to restore our hope, and to bring people into relationship with Jesus Christ. To know God and to love like Him. Our words matter. Let's stand as we praise this morning. I, I want you to see the evidence and the words, to examine it in your hearts, to, to ask the question, are the things I need to make right, are the things that I need to say on the way home, because God is all around us and my life is changing. I am a living example of the evidence of His love. Let's praise Him.